Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. It is Sunday. It is the 2022 version of, I'm going to say October the 10th or 11th. I don't know. I don't know. No idea, to be honest. I haven't looked at a calendar for a while. <laughs> How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? You're back here with me, Sean Butler, at the Spurs Talk Show, alongside, of course, my ever-present, currently hiding, co-anchor, Bugsy Malone. Bugsy! Hey! She'll be here in a minute. As we bring to you episode 62 of Tottenham Walks. First and foremost, if you're new to the channel, then welcome. Here she comes. Come on. If you're not new here, welcome back. How's everybody doing? Did you wake up this morning, similar to me, and get that whiff, that aroma, lingering in the air of three points of success, of victory, following last night's brilliant, yet tough, away fixture to Brighton and Hove Albion, a team that are very capable of upsetting the big boys in the league, especially away from home, or at home for them. It was good. Look, it wasn't pretty. For sure it wasn't pretty. But we're going to talk about that. Before we get going, guys, if you wouldn't mind just doing me a solid, uh, you hit that like button, the, sh the subscribe button, and the notification bell. Morning, guys. Afternoon, even. Then it really helps the algorithm push this content out to new people who might enjoy spending the afternoon, or a few minutes of it, walking around the beautiful countryside of Southwest Surrey. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you think about it? How do you feel about it even? For me, the, the good vibe started about an hour before the game as we saw the team sheet announced. And for the first time this season, Tottenham boss Antonio Conte and his coaching staff had decided to break trend and go with a formation that I'm not going to say everybody because <laughs> there's some people who will probably claim that they wanted 352 but have never really ever said it. <laughs> but anyway, we went to a 352 and it worked. It was a brilliant move, easily justifiable based on recent performances. Um, the only surprise for me in the initial starting 11 was Ben Davies that was picked ahead of Clement Longley. But you know what? That turned out to be a, a very astute decision because to a man, I thought yesterday, everybody put in a shift. We're going to go through in just a moment the individuals, but let's reflect for a second on the game in its general overview. If you look at the stats this morning, it won't tell you the story, or maybe it tells you a story that shows a very balanced game, a game that could have gone either way. If you look at the trend and the flow of opportunities, according to some of the stat websites, then it will suggest that Brighton were unlucky. And maybe they could argue a draw would have been a fair result, especially given Tottenham's approach to the second half. Hi guys. The First half started really well. The opening 15, 20 minutes, Tottenham were all over them in the 3-5-2 with Hoiberg and Benton core allowed to be a little bit further up the pitch. The average stats, the average position stats, which I'm going to see if I can put it in the screen right now for you, were so much more further up the field. Again, I'll see if I can compare it to the average position stats against Arsenal away the week before, which was a completely different story. And for me, tells the tale of, of how we should be looking to, to try to twist and shape ourselves differently as we go into the remainder of this very difficult two game a week period before the World Cup. Playing further up the field allowed us to press Hoiberg and Bentoncourt 
busy on the press whenever Brighton recycled the ball and they couldn't get control of it at all. For the first 20 minutes, it was all Tottenham. Plenty of opportunities, none taken again. And then eventually we got our, our opener, an absolutely fantastic header, just an absolutely delicious technique that again goes to highlight the competencies of Mr. Harry Kane, who I've got to be honest, if it wasn't for the fact that Erling Haaland is scoring nearly two goals a game on average, everybody in the media would be talking about Harry Kane right now and the fact that he, despite playing in a team that isn't particularly playing great football, and he himself, who hasn't been particularly exceptional with his decision-making, his passing, or his shooting during the opening, whatever it is, 12 games we played this season, nine of them in the league. The man has eight goals. He's currently on the trajectory in the Premier League. If he was to play every, uh, you know, every game in the Premier League and continue at the current rate of scoring, he would score over 30 goals this year. Yet no one's talking about him. No one's really talking about Tottenham. Everyone's focused on Arsenal as the team to catch City and everyone's focusing on Haaland as the, the striker that is making the world sit up straight and say, who is this guy and what the hell is he capable of? One second. Sorry about that. So yeah, brilliant from Harry Kane. As I say, the technique to get that header was fantastic. Supplied again by his constant partner in crime, Xiong Min Sun. It's lovely to see those two continue to build on that record that they have of goal assist, goal scored combinations. And on the day, I thought Sonny was really, really good. Very impressive. He was busy playing slightly deeper than Harry Kane, in my opinion. You know, usually we'd see Harry Kane coming slightly deeper and Xiong Min Sun playing on the on the edge but I thought the two of them were interchangeable and if anything could be wrong about this but if anything I'd say that Sonny played on the whole a little bit more deeper than than, than Harry Kane did um, the one thing I would say about Sonny is he's so desperate to get his goal occasionally again just dribbled the ball a little bit too long held on to it a little bit too long looking for the, the space to to turn and have a shot when simpler decisions could have been made. Even the goal that was disallowed for being offside when he cracked it top left locker in the top bin, had that been onside and had he missed, I know it's all a bit, lots of if buts and maybes, but you know, Ryan Sessignon was in absolutely acres of space and it turned out not to matter on either front because he got, he scored and it was onside, but it, was, it would have been far easier probably to have just slid Ryan Sessignon in. And that I think is a little bit of a concern for me with Sonny. Not that particular moment, but the thought processes right now. He's so desperate to score, so desperate to, to try to keep, keep up you know, with, with, with Harry Kane. I think sometimes it clouds his better judgment. But on the whole, I thought he played very well on the day. Moving slightly back down the field, hi guys. I think if you were to be a reasonable man, <laughs> a reasonable or reasonable lady, depending on who's watching this, you would have to acknowledge that Ryan Sessignon shouldn't have got the man in the match performance that Sky gave him. For me, it was a toss up between Hoiberg and Bentoncourt. I think Hoiberg probably won it hands down in the end. I've never seen a man who is so capable of playing at full pace, fifth gear, uh, for 90 minutes every single week, every week of the year for the last two and a half years. And he seems to be getting better and better. You know, I was guilty of saying last season that his ceiling was here and he plays close to it as a guy who loves Hoiberg, but I looked at him and thought he doesn't have, probably doesn't have that additional level to go to. But this season, 
I think he has shown that he does have that extra level to go to and it it's from his passion and his fight and his just intrinsic leadership qualities that he wants to thrive and put his everything on the line all the time for his shirt and if we had 11 players in our team that had the same mentality and psychological psychological strength as Pierre and Hoiberg then I think we would be, you know, the sky would be the limit. Some of the other players, I'm not entirely sure, have that, uh, have that kind of propensity to, to go get it at all times. But I also think that having the instruction to go further forward, the liberty to play further up the pitch and go and attack the, you know, the midfield of Brighton, McAllister had a torrid afternoon against. Bentoncourt and Hoiberg, Trossard and Gross were given, at least in the first half, were given very, very little time to be comfortable on the ball. And that, I think, was because of the fact we had three men in midfield. Now, look, Basuma came in, obviously. For me, I didn't think Basuma was anywhere near as spectacular as Hoiberg and Bentoncourt. But I do think that having him there, he was... He allowed the other two to, to do what they did with the reassurance of him being behind. I don't think he was as comfortable on the ball. I think he gave the ball a few too many, uh, gave the ball away a few too many times. And once or twice he looked all out of sorts, all at sea when it came to his positioning. When Brighton did have the ball. But overall, I think as the game progressed, he got better and stronger and 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 uh, was a very much a, 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 an integral part of that midfield battle that Tottenham ended up winning on the day. So we go into half time 1 0 up and we come out second half. And unfortunately, the only real criticism I have about the team and the, the, the mentality or the instruction for me was it seemed like we slowed the entire game down, took the pace out of the game in the second half, sat back almost went to a 5-4-1 at times, gave Brighton a lot more of the ball, and uh, in an effort to kind of just take the sting out and, and take the pace out, uh, almost became vulnerable all too often to some really good play from the front three of Brighton. Danny Welbeck had some chances, and Trossard and Gross again looked very dangerous. Hugo Lloris, got to call him out, you know, made three or four great saves in the game. Not, I wouldn't say spectacular saves, but saves he would be, would be expected to make, but still important saves. His distribution was far better. Not always deliberately. <laughs> we were laughing about this on the uh, Irish Shots. For, you, what, yesterday was one of those days where even when he misclicked and mishit the, the clearance, he, <laughs> he still managed to find its way to a Tottenham shirt. So by hook or by crook, you know, by hook or by crook, but I was relatively impressed with Hugo, and it's so reassuring to know that regardless of the guy's ability sometimes to make silly mistakes, generally speaking as a shot stopper, he's one of the best in the league. Very assured. And look, I thought Eric Dyer, Ben Davies were were competent on the on the on the evening. Uh, did their job. Especially in the second half, late in the second half, when, when Brighton had so much time, so many attempts to run forward and try and get into our box. Generally speaking, whilst it looked dangerous, I never really felt too much under threat. I always felt like there was somebody there to pick the pocket. Whether it was Benson Core getting back or Eric Dyer getting his foot in as a team, we defended well. We did defend deep, which I don't like, but I think it's part and parcel of, of the the instruction. First half we played far further up the field, second half we took our foot off the gas and sat a little bit deep. So it was a very boring and dull second half, but for me I thought on the night it was a very clever setup by Conte, very much overdue and something that I look to see more of going forward if we're playing against tough teams away from home. 
and maybe even if we're playing against tough teams at home. I would expect us though next week against Everton, should Decky be fit again, I would expect us to go 3-4-3 at home against Everton and in other games where we're playing against the, the bottom half teams, I don't want us to kind of throw the baby out with the bath water and, and say because it worked 3-5-2, that means that 3-4-3 now is yesterday's tactic. That's not what I've ever asked for or called for. For me, having the ability to be adaptable, unpredictable and balanced in your tactical decisions is an asset and a necessary part of the jigsaw and of the mind games that, you, that, you're, that you're playing. You know, half of the game of football, I think, is won or lost in, in being, like I say, unpredictable in, in the way that you set your team up and, and not allowing the opposition to be overly confident in what you're going to do when you do or don't have the ball. And so having this now as a, a feather in our cap, a tool in our toolbox, you know, I think is a wonderful thing. But look, it wasn't perfect. I would say that I thought Christian Romero doesn't look like he's anything like as good as he was last season. I liked, I, I appreciate his performance against Frankfurt. I thought that might be the catalyst to get him back to something like his, his last season's peak. But again, yesterday he looked positionally weak, sloppy and slow at times, and his decision-making was silly. And I get a little bit concerned about that because he's our best centre-back at the moment playing probably the worst of the three. And that's not going to be a popular opinion, but I think you have to take your, you know, your favourite's hat off and try and view situations as balanced and impartial as you can and try not to be too much of a hypocrite where if you criticise one person or one player or one thing, then you have to be consistent regardless of who that person is and what they've done. Wingbacks. Look, Sessegnon got man of the match. I thought he was very good defensively, second half. Going forward, he, he was pretty good. You know, he put lots of balls into the area um, in dangerous positions and that weren't met by the, the players that should have been there. So I, I wouldn't say he wasn't near the, the top end of the, of the team, of the player performances, but I don't think he was man of the match for me. I think Pierre Mohoiberg, excuse me, got gas. Pierre Mohoiberg was, uh, was my champion of the evening. And Matt Doherty, look, I mean, in the first half he got busy. He was running into spaces, but um, again, a couple of wasted opportunities. I thought he took that shot that bounced. I thought he hit the ball into the ground very well. I thought he did everything that was right. Very tough, very tough technically to get that ball on target. And I won't blame him too much for that one. But he was, he was exposed a little bit defensively in the second half, continuously getting twisted and turned. But hopefully, you know, those, those uh, I guess, creases will get ironed out with some extra minutes. If he's going to be played more, I still think that Jed Spence deserves a, uh, deserves a go because Matt Doherty wasn't, wasn't uh, good enough, in my opinion, to think that he should suddenly command his spot in the team. Morning, afternoon. So, look, all in all, I think I've been talking now for quite a while, but all in all guys, I think the takeaways are very positive. There's far more, there's only really a couple of, couple of uh, negatives on the day. One of them was just the shame about Romero's performance really, which is a bit of a concern. And the two is the fact that in the second half, I think we either deliberately or just by accident ended up taking the pace out of the game and you know maybe the idea there is that Conte doesn't think that we're quite there ready quite prepared to be on the front foot the entire 90 minutes and that you have something to protect so protect it I can I can understand the three points are more important than than anything else and the performance in the first half was good enough for me to not moan about the overall performance so Love to know your thoughts, guys. This has been a uh, 
fast pace on this walk today. I'm out of breath. So I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to let you go and enjoy the Arsenal Man United game. Oh, sorry, Arsenal Liverpool game. And let's hope that they knock seven shades of poo out of each other and they all get injured. 22 injuries would be lovely. <laughs> I'm joking. Don't wish injuries on anybody. All right, guys. I will see you tomorrow for the next one. Like, share, and subscribe. Oh. <laughs> Bugsy's in a fight. Like, share, and subscribe. And as always, guys, as always, bye-bye.